The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Philip R. Nader Legacy of Health Lectureship. My name is Deanna Helscher, and I am the Regional Dean of the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin and founding director of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. Today's webinar is hosted by our Center for Healthy Living at the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin. The center's vision is healthy children in a healthy world. Before we get started, I'd just like to make a few housekeeping announcements. Number one, the web webinar is being recorded and will be archived along with the presentation slides at our website at msdcenter.org. And we will give you that uh, website information again later in the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the questions chat box. We will have time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So next, I would like to talk a little bit about the Srila and Vibhu Sharma Endowed Fellowship for Excellence in Community Nutrition, Health, and Wellness. We traditionally highlight this endowment at this event. The Dell Center houses several endowments that make lectureships like today's possible. The Srila and Vibhu Sharma Endowed Fellowship provides a stipend and project experiences for selected students to work with Brighter Bites, a nonprofit profit organization that aims to improve healthy eating behaviors by providing a routine distribution of fresh produce, along with corresponding education in schools and at home. This fellowship requires a research commitment of two semesters and provides the fellow an opportunity to engage in public health nutrition research, including data analysis, writing manuscripts, and co-authorship on publications. Since 2017, we have had five Sharma Fellows who have gone on to use their experiences to better public health nutrition. The past Fellows include Melinda Rushing, Jennifer Iyer, Brittany Naylor, Fang Yu Li, and Nivahithu Partha Saranthe. I'm happy today to announce our newest 2021-2022 Sharma Fellow, Victoria Quintua. Victoria Quintua, MPH, is pursuing her doctorate in health promotion and Behavioral Sciences at the UT Health School of Public Health in Houston with a minor in epidemiology and a certificate in maternal and child health. So she really is a good fit for this fellowship. She earned her master's degree in public health with a concentration in maternal and child health from the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth. We wanna give a welcome and congratulations to Victoria. In addition, we'd like to acknowledge the Sharma family for their con commitment to public health nutrition and to the UT Health School of Public Health. Thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Srila Sharma, who is Professor of Epidemiology at the UT Health School of Public Health and a Dell Center member. She will introduce members from University of California at San Diego to talk about their organization and Dr. Nader's legacy there. After that, she will then introduce today's keynote speaker. So stay tuned for a really invigorating and intellectually stimulating presentation. Dr. Sharma? Thank you, Dr. Halsher. <laughs> it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, as Dr. Helcher mentioned, I'm Srila Sharma. I'm a professor of epidemiology uh, at the University of Texas School of Public Health. Uh, I'm based in Houston, and I'm also a faculty member in the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. Well, before we start today's keynote, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Dr. Nader's legacy 
and then also introduce Dr. Howard Harris and Blanca Melendres from the University of California, San Diego, who will share a bit about their work and Dr. Nader's hand in, uh, in uh, initiating that. Uh, Dr. Nader was incredible in his legacy that he's left behind. He was the founder of uh, UCSD Center for Community Health, as well as a trusted and valued advisor for the San Diego County Childhood Obesity Initiative from its inception in 2006. Dr. Phil Nader dedicated his career to the advancement of child health, and I myself had the pleasure of working with him uh, from about 2013 through 2017 uh, for the work that he did here in Texas with us um, in advancing maternal and child health. His contributions to our understanding of the early life cycle systems are cemented in his legacy of health. The aim of uh, this annual lectureship, thanks to uh, Phil and his family, is to promote and strengthen the nexus between health theory and practice in, in two important ways. First, the Nader Legacy of Health Lectureship is designed to educate and inform academics, providers, public health students, and community members about early life cycle systems. Today, we are fortunate to learn from and be inspired by Dr. Rafael Perez Escamilla from the Yale School of Public Health, and I'll introduce him in just a minute. Second, this event is intended to stimulate cooperation and collaboration among physicians, patients, family, and the community. The goal is to move towards improved health status for parents and children, a legacy of health for generations to come. We are so thankful for Dr. Nader's leadership, and we are very excited to have some of Dr. Nader's family members in attendance today as well. So thank you very much from uh, all of us. And with that, uh, we'll hand it over to Dr. Howard Terrace and Blanca Melendres to talk a little bit about Dr. Nader's legacy at UCSD. Dr. Terrace. Yes, thank you very much. That was um, a very nice introduction. And, and I, I, I know Phil Nader because he hired me in 1985, just two years after he left uh, uh, Texas. And at that time, he was working on a, a grant that he had applied to when he was still um, at University of Texas. Um, and the grant was, you know, community outreach to reduce um, cardiovascular risk. Um, but um, what he did is he reached those children through elementary schools. Um, we often think of Dr. Phil Nader's um, legacy as being um, just about cardiovascular health, healthy diets and exercise, but actually um, Dr. Phil Nader began, I believe his, um, his understanding of how to reach communities through his expertise and leadership in the field of school health. Um, he really changed school health as much as he changed how we do cardiovascular behavior change um, and uh, research. Um, the schools um, in, in Texas um, and when he moved here, um, he, he was a consultant too. And unlike most school health where you would run clinics and do clinical work, um, Dr. Phil Nader very much understood that the real power of having physicians in school was not to examine kids in a school setting, but it was to uh, change the behaviors, to actually change the policies that affect children in schools, to affect community policy through schools. And so he didn't really provide actual physical exams um, in schools in either Texas or when he moved here. And you can see how that um way of dealing with health problems through schools led to much of the research that he did later on in cardiovascular health so uh i would like to kind of um recognize that 
um, this was um, an important trajectory for him and it led to changes in my career and into school health um, across this country. School health is different because of Phil Nader. And so is how we reach children through their families, particularly immigrants. Um, Dr. Phil Nader started with uh, Mexican American immigrants. And how do you reach them? How do you gain trust? And schools were the way to do that. And um, the way to reach families was through children. Um, it, his, 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 the title of his projects and of our center became Child and Family Health Studies uh, for that reason. I think Dr. Phil Nader would have been very impressed with this speaker today and a lot of the work that he's done, as well as the work of the Dell Center for Healthy Living. And, um, and so uh, um, I wish I could see his family members, his daughter and his son who are out there, because um, I miss seeing you guys. Um, but I'm, I'm very proud of the, the entire Nader family for um, having this lectureship and for continuing um, the legacy that he started. Thank you. Uh, Blanca, uh, Blanca Melendres, please. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak about Dr. Nader's legacy at UC San Diego Center for Community Health. My name is Blanca Melendres. I'm the Executive Director for Community Health at the Elman Clinical and Translational Research Institute. I had the pleasure uh, to begin my public health career under Dr. Nader's leadership over 20 years ago. One of my last and fond memories is when Dr. Nader and I attended a national obesity conference. And at a, after a plenary session um, during Q&A, one of the participants asked, I heard Dr. Nader is in the room. Can he please stand up? He stood up and the entire room stood up to applaud. I knew he was the most incredible mentor I could have had, uh, but I had no idea I was with a celebrity as well. Today, I am here to share one component only of Dr. Nader's leadership as a founder of Community Peds, later known as the Center for Community Health, over the last 20 years as it relates to community engagement and health equity. Next slide, please. The Center for Community Health is a multidisciplinary group of physicians, researchers, public health practitioners, and we are dedicated to promoting evidence-based health practices at a community level. Next slide, please. We are very unique to the university. Uh, we operate like a grassroots nonprofit arm of the university, and we've been advocating for social justice and health equity in communities of color over the last 30 years. Next slide. And the center itself has been part of the Department of Pediatrics since 1987. And for over 30 years, um, we have a lot of great stories to share about the impact of his legacy in communities of color. Next slide. So key areas of our work um, is really around chronic disease and obesity prevention. So we've been working on access to healthy eating, physical activity, and food insecurity over the last 20 years. Uh, our foundational work started with Five a Day in the 1990s. We pilot, we were one of the pilot sites for the, for the state of California. And as a result of that program, which is known as the largest and longest running public health program in the country that works with low income communities addressing obesity prevention, um, we were able to grow the work in that field. And our funding comes from all sources, state, federal, and foundations as well. Everything that we do and how we approach our work is through the social ecological model, from the individual to the policy level. And I'm going to provide some brief examples of that work. But we are very much in the community, very involved across the county and the state. We believe in strong collaboration in the public and private sector. And the majority of the work that we do happens in the community. And we are very proud of that focus. Our goal at the end is to work towards creating policy changes that supports systems and environmental changes that positively impact the health of our community. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this slide provides an overview of all the different programs in the last 20 years that the center um, has implemented as a result of the SNAPID program and part of the legacy of Dr. Nader. 
working uh, in school wellness and employee wellness, food insecurity, youth advocacy, all the way to lactation accommodation, supportive environments, and so on. Next slide. We did an exercise um, that I wanted to share here. In, in 2019, um, our reach is, is wide and deep, and we have many partners that been, we've been working over the last 30 years. We could not do this work um, without our interns, without our partners in the public and private sectors. But what you can see here is um, in 2019, we were able to identify 40 different policy systems and environmental change strategies that were implemented in over a thousand sites addressing access to healthy food, physical activity and food insecurity in the workplace, in faith-based communities, in retail locations, and so on. So in partnership with all these different groups, groups um, together, you know, we allow to be very engaged and inform and advocate for healthier communities. So from encouraging urban agriculture policy and land access, to signing and building community gardens, creating walkable communities and bikeable streets to healthy food, launching of faith-based food and summer meal distribution sites, to implementing lactation accommodations, and also opening the first farmer's market in the country that accepted food stamps in a low-income neighborhood in San Diego County. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we are very focused in food insecurity. Um, and access to healthy food and nutrition. At that uh, point, about a few years ago, we were still had the highest food stamp participation rate at that farmer's markets in City Heights um, in the country. Next slide, please. So one of the most recent highlights um, that I wanna share with you is we um, establish a refugee health unit. We have the largest refugee resettlement in the state of California, in San Diego County. And I believe we're the second or third largest in the country. Our mission is to protect, promote, and improve the physical, mental, and financial well being of our refugee population in San Diego. We've also become the backbone organization for the San Diego Refugee Communities Coalition. And we establish a youth advisory council comprised of students from low income high schools with immigrant and refugee backgrounds that are advocating at the local and state level for healthier communities. If you heard of universal school meals, our youth went to the state assembly and testified based on their lived experience for universal school meals. Next slide. We are also um, very active in urban food equity. So working with farmers markets, with food pantries, with retailers, and really try and increase access to healthy food. We can go to the next slide. I know we're short on time. This is um, a program that built from opening the first mar farmers market in City Heights in San Diego County um, over 15 years ago. In 2016, we received a USDA grant to create a innovative technology nutrition incentive program funded by USDA GUSNIP. And the Mas Fresco and More Fresh program is a randomized controlled trial program. It's focused on a point of sale technologies in Norgue Gonzalez market, which is the largest Hispanic retailer in the country. And what we did is we developed a technology that links a loyalty card with the EBT purchases among CalFresh participants, and we offer up to $100 a month to address access to healthy food um, and food insecurity. We are in 41 markets across Southern California, and we have increased access to healthy food, decreased food insecurity significantly, and currently we have over 8,000 CalFresh participants engaged in this program. And very successfully, this program has generated over $13 million that we have received to expand this program across the state. Next slide. And finally, um, Dr. Nader was a valued and trusted advisor to the San Diego Childhood Obesity Initiative. Um, from its inception, he was a founding member. His forward-thinking approach and focus on system changes proved to be a catalyst for innovation and he influenced also the surveillance of childhood obesity initiative in the county by tracking child body mass index within San Diego Regional Immunization Registry. But um, the San Diego County Childhood Obesity Initiative 
is the largest and longest running public-private multi-sector coalition in the country that addresses child health. So from focusing on policy systems and environmental changes to ensure that our families are um, living in physical and social environments that allow for healthy choices to take place, to most recently looking at root causes of health disparities, centering the work in the community, and supporting um, this effort. So Dr. Nader would be very proud to know that we are now the backbone organization for a coalition that he founded. And thank you very much for the opportunity to present about Dr. Nader's legacy. My last point is we have secured over $60 million in the last 20 years as part of his. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Blanca and Dr. Taras. Uh, that was that is incredible. Uh, and thank you for being here with us. And it's exciting to see all the different seeds of, of uh, that Dr. Nader has left behind. Um, so really appreciate that. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce this year's keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Rafael Perez Escamilla. Uh, Rafael Perez Escamilla is a tenured professor at the Yale School of Public Health, where he's also director of the Office of Public Health Practice, the Global Health Concentration, and the Center for Methods and Implementation and Population Science Maternal Child Health Promotion Program. His three decades uh, long research program has led to large scale global improvements in maternal, infant, and young child feeding, early childhood development, and also impacts, uh, has impacted household food security. His work has been based on rigorous and elegant observational, epidemiological, experimental, and quasi-experimental studies complemented with implementation science, mixed research methods, grounded in complex adaptive systems frameworks. He's an elected member of the US National Academy of Medicine and the recipient of numerous awards. I, I think I could take up the whole lectureship time if I were to go through those. He has served as a senior scientific advisor to UNICEF, WHO, FAO, US Department of Agriculture, DHHS, USAID, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's really incredible. He currently serves in the WHO multi-country infant feeding marketing study, five member senior advisory group, the steering committee of the new Lancet breastfeeding series, two, two WHO infant and young child um, uh, feeding expert committees, the WHO nurturing care framework implementation group, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation expert panel developing comprehensive dietary recommendations for children two to eight years old in the context of nurturing care. He obtained his BS in chemical engineering. My husband's a chemical engineer, by the way. <laughs> uh, very smart people. From Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. And his MS in food science, doctorate in nutrition, and postdoctorate in early childhood development from the University of California at Davis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Perez Escamilla. Thank you. Thank you so uh, very much, uh, Dr. Sharma, for your very, very kind introduction. And I am going to start uh, sharing my presentation. But while I do that, I want to express my enormous uh, gratitude uh, to the Michael and Susan Dell Center at the University of Texas and to the family of Dr. Phil Nader for giving me the privilege of being the 2021 uh, uh, Phil Nader le lecturer. So today I am going to talk about a topic that I think uh, would have made uh, Dr. Nader uh, very happy to listen about given the enormous influence 
that he has had on the thinking in this field. I am going to talk about responsive feeding and childhood obesity prevention and equitable nurturing care perspective. First, I will briefly go over the great importance of the first 1,000 days for human development, and then I will move on on presenting some statistics and uh, issues related to maternal and childhood obesity to rapidly then cover the meat of this presentation, which is how we can address better childhood obesity prevention and management moving forward through the nurturing care a framework. And I will emphasize the role of responsive feeding as part of this new approach and will conclude with some reflections on what a, I think the way forward it should be in our field. So let's talk a little bit about the first 1000 days which cover the period of gestation through the first uh, two years uh, of life. First of, of all, we know that the incredible speed in physical growth in early life illustrates the window of opportunity that this time period uh, offers and the need for ensuring a household food security for all to properly be able for the families to be able to meet the age specific food and nutritional requirements during this massively important period when it comes to the growth of infants and young children. Growing evidence is now clearly indicating that the primordial prevention of the development of non-communicable diseases such as heart disease and type 2 diabetes later on in life really includes, uh, it needs to include a nutritional uh, food security issues during the first uh, 1,000 days of life. So what happens during the first 1,000 days has repercussions for the rest of the life of a human being. We also know that uh, during gestation, if uh, the mothers uh, received adequate uh, healthcare access, if they were not a uh, exposed to toxic stress if they were well nourished and it's very likely they will end up delivering a healthy newborn that has about a 100 billion neurons at birth and it's easier said a 100 billion than to grasp what it means what is equivalent to that number or all the number of all the stars that we have in our universe once uh, the babies are born they immediately start developing uh, connections uh, uh, across these uh, neurons, a uh, process that is called synaptogenesis. And it is through their daily experiences uh, moving around and exploring their environment that they start developing these synapses that will allow them to develop the skills that are necessary for uh, a healthy uh, uh, physical, uh, cognitive psychosocial development. So you can see that the speed at which these synapses uh, develop during the first two years of life uh, in response to nurturing uh, ways uh, of exploring and experiencing their environments is totally, absolutely mind boggling. Trillions and trillions of synapses are formed during uh, between birth and the second year of life. And uh, we know that, for example, it is through the synaptic process that uh, babies uh, learn how to uh, how to sit, how to stand, how to walk, then how to start uh, 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 moving more rapidly. It's how they learn uh, how uh, to 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 start babbling, uh, to start learning language, and develop the language skills are are so important for also their ability to develop abstract thinking later on and their ability to learn numbers and, and on and on. So from a neuroscience perspective, it is absolutely magic also what happens or what should happen with regards to the development of the brain when children are exposed to proper food security, nutrition, healthcare access, and, and so on. 
We also know that the first 1,000 days of life are incredibly important for the children uh, to learn to develop healthy food uh, preferences. There is no other time period in the lifetime of a human where at the almost at the speed of light, uh, the uh, conceptus, conceptus and fetus moves from actually feeding from the placenta to then actually uh, being fed uh, through breastfeeding or human milk uh, and at around six months to be introduced to a variety of healthy, nutritious, safe, complementary foods that then need to get more and more diversified and being fed with different types of textures for the babies to end up how to learn to develop healthy food preferences, probably a, a, a trait that would remain for the rest a, of, of their lives. So the what, first 1,000 days, indeed, they are a unique window of opportunity a, to support the growth, metabolic health, and also to reduce a, NCD risk a, through the development of healthy food a, habits or preferences. And, and why is this? So work from Julie, Julie Manella, the Monell Chemical Census uh, has shown that indeed uh, what mother eats during pregnancy starts influencing the future uh, food preferences, flavor preferences of uh, the, the baby because flavors are passed from the mothers to the fetus through the amniotic fluid. We also know that uh, women who breastfeed uh, really pass a very large variety or diversity of flavors to the infant based on the foods that uh, they consume. So if they consume lots of fish, well, the uh, human milk is going to have a, a taste of fish. If they consume uh, hot peppers, uh, I believe if, uh, it is very likely that uh, the human milk will be a little bit more, uh, more tasty uh, as well. At the end of the day, this exposure to a higher diversity of flavors appears to facilitate the ability of breastfed babies to accept more readily fruits and vegetables and children who are formula fed. Formula fed babies can also end up accepting foods low in sugar, salt, and bitter tasting, such as many vegetables, but it will take much more tries, especially for the veggies to be accepted if the baby is formula fed versus uh, versus versus breastfed. So uh, we know then that uh, the first 1000 days of life also represents then a major opportunity, a very sensitive period for the development of healthy food preferences. From a child development a psychobehavioral point of view, it is important also to acknowledge the enormous contributions from Leanne Birch and her team at really helping the world understand the different pathways uh, through which behavioral pathways through which uh, human beings learn uh, to develop food preferences. First, uh, familiarization is very important and that's where the very strong recommendation for a repeated exposure to healthy foods such as vegetables is needed for uh, the kids to learn to accept them, uh, like them, and enjoy them. We also uh, know that uh, the babies and infants and young children uh, associate different foods with different experiences that happen while they were being offered those foods or are being offered those foods. So if it's in a very stressful environment and the kids are screamed at and the experience is just not uh, happening in a good atmosphere, the kids are not going to learn to like uh, the foods that are associated with those, uh, with those episodes. So this is where it's really important for the feeding process to include very caring, uh, loving, and psycho-emotionally supportive interactions between the caregivers, their families, and the infants and young children in a, in a very psycho-emotionally supportive atmosphere. And contrary to what uh, scientists used to think uh, a century ago, actually, you know, babies are very smart since birth. You remember they have a hundred billion neurons and they're absorbing everything like a sponge and they're observing what their caregivers are eating. 
uh, what their caregivers are doing, how they relate to each other. And at the end of the day, it will be much easier for infants and young children to establish healthy food preferences by if they observe their caregivers eating healthy foods as well. So now after this brief intro to the marvelous uh, period of the first 1000 days, I want to put in the context of this period why it has been so incredibly difficult to break the childhood obesity pandemic that we are having. And this is because it involves the transfer of risk from one generation to the next through a maternal uh, cycle as well as a newborn and infant cycle. We know that women who are overweight or obese uh, by the time of conception are also more likely to gain excessive gestational weight and these two factors combined increase the neonatal dis dis predisposition uh, or the predisposition of the newborn to become obese and develop non-communicable diseases uh, later on in life. And this is especially true if the babies are not breastfed exclusively for six months uh, before the introduction of healthy complementary foods, if the complementary foods are uh, ultra processed, they are junk food, if they are introduced to sugar sweetened beverages and, and so on, these suboptimal infant feeding practices are going to lead to excessive uh, weight gain during infancy, which is a major risk factor for uh, the development of obesity uh, later on later on in life. And even uh, if they are not uh, overweight or obese, say by kindergarten, if they were exposed to all of these negative uh, uh, situations uh, during uh, gestation and the first uh, couple of years of life, they are going to also be more likely to become overweight or obese as uh, adolescents, because uh, they're growing in very, obesogenic environments uh, full of ultra processed foods and sedentary behaviors and stressful uh, exposures uh, without knowing how to properly management, manage them and so on. So then they will become in the future the next generation of, of parents and uh, uh, they are likely then to also transmit the risk to their offspring as well. So this uh, cycle uh, for it to be broken, it is also important to acknowledge that moms that gain excessively during gestation, they are also more likely to gain excessive uh, postpartum, uh, any excessive weight during the postpartum period. And then the next time they get uh, overweight or pregnant, uh, they're going to be more, the, 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 next, the next time they get pregnant, they're going to be more uh, overweight or obese and the, the, the risk of uh, incurring into the neonatal predisposition for obesity of the newborn will be even, even greater. So the first 1000 days are crucial to be addressed through proper food security, proper uh, access to, uh, to nutrition, health services and so on, if we really want to prevent the, and break this enormous uh, global pandemic. We're not doing very well in the US where more than half of births are to women who begin pregnancy already with overweight with strong disparities across racial and uh, ethnic groups. And I should refer to them as inequities because that's what they are. They are not only differences, but very inequitable uh, uh, differences reflecting huge social injustice issues affecting women of color. Also, we know that in the US, uh, only a third of women are meeting the gestational weight gain recommended uh, based on their pre-pregnancy BMIs. And we see the enormous proportion of women that are starting uh, uh, that, that, that uh, gain excessively if they are overweight uh, or obese. Uh, we now know also that uh, the childhood obesity epidemic can be detected since very early childhood. During the first uh, two years of life, it is already very apparent uh, with some states having rates like Texas between 14 and 16 and a half percent of children uh, being, uh, being overweight. And in practically all the states are, are huge ethnic racial disparities 
Uh, and for example, in the country as a whole, these prevalence rates ranged from 16% among American Indian or Alaska Native uh, infants, uh, all the way to eight and a half percent against Asian or Pacific Islanders. And um, believe me, eight and a half percent, it's still a very high uh, proportion of, of overweight. But these inequities persist and it, they are also a reflection of uh, social injustice uh, since uh, the babies are conceived and subsequently once they, they are born. Uh, this obesity epidemic is not at all, should not be at all surprising uh, to any of us because we know that in the US among children between one and two years of age, less than half have eaten uh, eat a vegetable daily, one in three drink a sugar sweetened beverage daily, by two to five years of age, 14% of them then are obese, and nearly one in five children under six years of age live in poor insecure households, which at least among women, among adult women, is also a risk factor for overweight or obesity. And based on the maternal child cycle, that risk can get then transmitted to the next uh, generation as a result of food insecurity. An incredibly helpful report uh, that's called Fed to Fail was just released by UNICEF uh, about uh, a week ago or so, showing that in low and middle income countries, still stunting or chronic undernutrition continues to be a problem with a strong inequities reflected across regions and by gender, that underweight or wasting is still a problem, but it's also fully documenting how overweight has also become a massive or is becoming a massive a public health nutrition problem in low and middle income countries. And many <clears throat> children in these countries, not only it is because they are becoming uh, overweight uh, at a very fast rate uh, of increase, but they oftentimes live in households uh, where their caregivers are overweight uh, or, or obese. Even if they are stunted or underweight, 70%, for example, of women in Mexico City, 70% of women in Egypt of reproductive age are overweight or obese. So the problem of the double burden of malnutrition, having the coexistence of undernutrition and overweight or overnutrition in the same households and sometimes even in the same individuals, is stunted children who are overweight is referred to as the double burden of malnutrition. So we're talking here not just about a problem in the US, about a problem in high income countries, but it is a global pandemic, the one related to childhood obesity. And uh, the report also shows that, uh, for example, uh, only among, among children, uh, uh, infants and young children, less than a third have the minimum dietary diversity that is so crucial to, for example, help them meet their nutritional needs and also develop a healthy food preferences. So the inescapable conclusion is that we need to revamp the existing uh, global uh, food system. And this food system is affecting children in high, middle, and low-income countries. And with regards to the quality of the diets that they consume, which are loaded with ultra-processed foods, junk foods, as well as sugar-sweetened sugar beverages, for which there is unquestionable evidence that they increase the risk of obesity and uh, many aspects of, uh, of poor health. So this is a, a picture provided in the report showing uh, the type of foods that, uh, uh, you know, chips and candies and ice cream and soda in the corner stores in many neighborhoods in, in, in low-income countries. Uh, and also it's not unusual for this to happen also in lower-income neighborhoods in in the US. So yes, we are in full agreement uh, in the field of public health nutrition that profound changes are needed for the first uh, food systems that uh, kids uh, in gestation and during infancy and early childhood are 
exposed to on a daily basis. I'm sorry that the screen sharing stopped working. Okay, so so Phil Baker and colleagues at working in in Australia are have actually highlighted the enormous need for the food systems. I'm very sorry. Are highlighting the need for the the these first food systems to be to be revamped, and they're particularly concerned about the major uptick in the sales of commercial milk formulas, especially in, in lower income countries, but it's also happening in middle income countries as, as we speak. And they are calling for increasing investments in breastfeeding protection, promotion and support, and actually to improve the regulation of the marketing practices from the food industry and there is there's very similar findings from uh, the us that were recently published just showing how out of control are the quite misleading oftentimes quite misleading marketing practices from infant formula companies that heavily are heavily uh, undermining uh, the success with uh, with breastfeeding uh, Phil Baker and colleagues have also done network analysis for all of us to understand that uh, the food industry, the infant food industry in many ways works as a global cartel where they are very well uh, coordinated and where they have enormous influence at uh, capturing uh, corporations, trade associations, uh, like the grocery manufacturers associations, the chambers of commerce, the dairy industry, trade associations, as well as confirm, consumer uh, uh, organization groups and industry funded scientific uh, organizations. So uh, it is not going to be easy to reform the very unhealthy ultra processed food systems that are so negatively affected, affecting infants and young children during the first 1000 days of life but it is really needed if we want to be to be serious about it so this leads me into the nurturing care section of the presentation where we recently published a paper trying to call for a reframing of the early childhood obesity pandemic not not only as a public health nutrition problem but actually as a problem that shows that the kids that are developing and suffering the psycho-emotional and physical consequences of it are not receiving uh, adequate uh, nurturing care. So this is as a result of social injustice and that's why we're calling for a childhood obesity prevention approach through an equitable a nurturing, nurturing care framework. At the end of the day, you will see that what we're proposing is a holistic life course approach to childhood obesity prevention that includes an equitable developmental uh, perspective. So what is nurturing care? So it is a, a concept that was finally developed uh, with a consensus of the more than 40 co-authors from the 2016 Lancet Early Childhood Development Series with input from stakeholders in many countries from all over the world. And nurturing care should be understood as a flower that has a five petals and all the petals need to envelope at the center of the flower, the child and the family of the child so that the infants and young children can grow and develop properly. So the petals refer to access to high quality care, food security and adequate nutrition, a responsive a parenting, a protection of children and families against any form of 
a violence uh, that is sexual, it could be physical, could be psycho-emotional, uh, preventing it from happening within uh, as well as outside the household. And the fifth petal is related to early stimulation, uh, the ability of the kids to perform fun physical activities through play, learn through those activities and have lots of uh, information and opportunities for uh, early learning. You can see that all of the petals are of the same size, mean, meaning that there isn't one that is more important than the other. All of them need to be offered simultaneously. Families need to have access to all of them for nurturing care to happen. A nurturing care requires stable environments where children receive love and stimulation that is responsive to their developmental stages. And this type of nurturing care environment needs to envelop the children since the very beginning of life. So moving on to responsive feeding, it is a nurturing care approach to nutrition that of course, in addition to making sure that kids are fed the, the right foods and, and so on. It also speaks about how this uh, should, be, should be done. So adequate nutrition during the first 1000 days of life, as mentioned, is crucial for proper physical growth, brain development, the immune system and, and so on. And at the end of the day, this is an investment that has a huge uh, return for countries in the form of better National, national development. A responsive feeding in terms of the how to feed is based on the principles of responsive parenting. And what responsive parenting acknowledges is that all the basic routines that the children need to practice all the time, day after day, as part of the nurturing care framework are intimately linked with each other. So the feeding episodes, the way children are calm when they are fussy or crying, sleep hygiene or sleep routines, physical activity, play routines and so on, they are all very, very heavily linked with each, with each, with each other. And at the end of the day, it is through all these multiple, you know, highly interconnected dimensions of responsive parenting that the kids end up eating what they eat, moving how much they move, and this ends up having very strong implications for energy balance and the likelihood that the children will end up developing uh, overweight uh, or not. The beauty of this uh, framework is that now half a dozen randomized controlled trials conducted in high income countries, mainly uh, Australia, New Zealand, and, uh, and the US have consistently shown that responsive parenting approaches improve feeding behaviors and may reduce the risk of early childhood overweight. So let's talk about some very uh, interesting applications uh, to real world education and counseling to families based on responsive on the responsive feeding uh, principles. So first of all, responsive feeding refers to feeding practices that encourage the child to eat autonomously and in response to physiological and developmental needs, which may encourage self-regulation in eating and support, cognitive, emotional, and social development. As part of the responsive feeding framework, you have often heard about the construct of parental feeding styles. So typically what we are expecting for responsive feeding to work well is for parents to have the responsive parental feeding, feeding style where they obviously have a degree of control in terms of uh, what choices, what are the choices that the child can have in terms of the, the different foods, the healthy beverages that they want to consume uh, and uh, to, to allow them to actually self-regulate because at the end of the day, responsive feeding, if performed well, leads to the ability of children to self-regulate their, their, their food intake. So it's not authority, Italian, but is authoritative and it is based on very, very nurturing interactions based on the nurturing care framework. There are 
uh, other types of feeding styles, such so as indulgent, allowing the child to eat as much junk food as a child wants, you know, as many sugar, sweetened beverages any time of the day or night, which is not, of course, what we recommend. The uninvolved uh, feeding style of actually not paying much attention to the children and while eating and everybody is texting in their cell phones and the TV on and uh, lots of distractions and no one really paying attention to what the child is, uh, is trying to communicate. And the controlling uh, parents who are uh, who really practice harsh discipline when it comes to dictating to the child uh, what they should eat and how much they should eat and when they should eat, uh, even if they may not be if they may not be hungry. So parental feeding styles uh, uh, research is totally relevant to the responsive feeding uh, literature. So the responsive feeding uh, framework, first of all. Uh, calls for the caregivers to learn how to identify the hunger and satiety signals that infants and young toddlers uh, give uh, since birth, uh, to recognize them and to respond in an emotionally supportive and developmentally appropriate way so that the child always receives a predictable nurturing response. A child understands that uh, the caregivers know when they're hungry, when uh, they have achieved a uh, society, and this really, really is super important for children to learn to self-regulate their food intake. So nurturing care needs to happen in a health eating environment where healthy food and beverages are offered or available, even though the children are free to make many of the decisions to be very much a a very important part of the decisions of how much they eat and you know if they want to play with the food if they want to smell it if they want to rub it against their hair and and so on all of that is part of a positive interactions between the caregiver and and the infant they must involve lots of verbalizations patience repeated exposure eat as a family pleasant environments developmentally appropriate textures and portion sizes and encourage the children to self-feed as soon as they are ready to do so. So these are uh, recommendations that, for example, a pediatrician uh, could give uh, to a caregiver or a community health worker when they are trying to explain how to practice responsive feeding. So feed the infants directly and assist uh, older ones when they feed themselves, but always being sensitive to hunger and satiety cues. Feed slowly and patiently, encourage the child to eat, but do not force the child. If children refuse as many foods, experiment with different food combinations, tastes, textures, and methods of encouragement. Minimize distractions during meals if the child loses interest easily. And remember that feeding times are periods of learning and love talk to the children to, uh, during feeding and practice eye, eye contact. So moving into the last part of my, of, of, of my Philip Nader lecture today, uh, what uh, do I think should be the way, the way forward? And it happens uh, just by, by serendipity that one of the papers that has influenced the most my thinking on what needs to happen to actually properly address the childhood obesity epidemic using an equitable nurturing care approach is this paper that was uh, published by Dr. Phil Nader and his team in 2012, really calling for altering the early life systems that surround uh, parents, infants, and toddlers. And there is no doubt in my mind that his vision is the one that is guiding a lot of the work that I do and that of several of my colleagues that are making headway in, in this area. He actually mapped very carefully a community systems framework for points of, of intervention. So he recognized that, in, I'm sorry, it just paused screen sharing again.
We can see your PowerPoint. Okay, so something appears here tells me. Okay, can you see it? Uh, we can see, yes, we can. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, I'm very sorry. I don't know what what happened there, but essentially the 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 he acknowledged that first and foremost, local, state, and national policies uh, that involve ur urban planning, housing, transportation, parks, uh, food access, uh, access to financing, as well as quality education, are very important. Media and information, uh, housing segregation issues industry practices as well as uh, labor practices and incentives or lack of incentives uh, for people to be able to eat healthier and move more around are crucial uh, for actually uh, households where infants and young children live to uh, take a, a policy approach to childhood obesity prevention. So uh, when it comes to the policies, of course, the healthcare system it has to be it driven and improved through policies as well, especially for primordial or primary prevention of childhood obesity by improving the funding, but also the way this, uh, this, this uh, healthcare is, is being provided. For example, by incorporating community health workers, integrating community health workers as part of the healthcare management teams. He fully acknowledged the interplay between the social and the physical environment. You cannot separate one from the other. And it is also very important what he did, which is to recognize that the community themselves can also shape their environments. So there are many constraints or enabling actions that can be taken to improve the social and physical environments to be able for families and the members of those families to eat healthier and you know move more around and have healthier lifestyles in, in general. It is important that the healthcare system is much more stronger, becomes much stronger at preventing services to families and individuals, and also to be able to afford to provide treatment as necessary. A healthcare providers' behaviors, a, a, a practices a, at the primary healthcare clinics, the federally qualified health centers, and so on, a, can serve as powerful advocates for social and environmental change to promote healthy lifestyles and at the end the empowerment of individuals in the communities and their effective mobilization to affect policy change closes the loop in the opposite direction to actually improve local state and national policies. So Dr. Nader and his team actually identified very specific points for behavior change interventions to address a childhood obesity epidemic. And I know I'm a little bit short on, on time, so you can read them, but they address the pregnancy, infancy period, as well as uh, the toddler years. And uh, they address both nutrition as well as uh, physical activity, screen time issues, and, and so on across uh, the, the first 1,000 days of life. So we also think very strongly that in order to translate this knowledge into policy uh, and more action, it, it is key for dietary guidelines for children under two years of age to include the nurturing care approach, the responsive feeding approach to health promotion and uh, childhood obesity, obesity prevention. Uh, thankfully, the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation through the Healthy Eating Research has already issued a very comprehensive set of uh, feeding guidelines for infants and young toddlers based on the responsive parenting slash responsive feeding framework that you can all uh, take a look at. We know that for the first time this year, the dietary guidelines for Americans are including recommendation for children under two. And as you can see, responsive feeding, uh, thankfully, especially the recognition of hunger and satiety cues, 
became a very central piece of the policy document that was very recently published. Uh, likewise, based on evidence from lower income countries, uh, UNICEF strongly recommends responsive feeding as part of their uh, guidance as, and to do it uh, together with the rest of the nurturing care practices to improve together a child a growth and the different aspects of their of their development. Uh, we recently concluded a consensus study at uh, the National Academy of Medicine where we compared the responsive feeding recommendations or infant and young child feeding recommendations across guidelines from high income countries and although they consistently had messages about several responsive uh, feeding behaviors such as self-feeding, self-regulation, and, and so on, none of them was presenting the guidelines uh, except the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation ones as part of a cohesive responsive parenting interdisciplinary framework. Moving forward, evidence-based uh, responsive feeding recommendations should be routinely incorporated and identified in dietary guidance for infants on uh, young children. And implementation science is absolutely needed to help us improve our understanding of how best to disseminate and implement responsive feeding related recommendations across settings, taking the social determinants of health into account. So these are some key conclusions from our uh, recent commentary on, on this consensus study. In terms of uh, the big research need, then given how much evidence has built in favor of strengthening responsive feeding as a childhood obesity prevention strategy, the question is how can we track it? So there is a need to develop a, hopefully a, a global scale to properly assess responsive feeding practices. Some promising work from Cambodia has been published. A, my team in partnership with my colleagues in Sri Lanka have also some work, done some work along these lines. And I know that Maureen Black's group and Chesa Luder are also engaged right now in an exercise like this in different, in different countries. So to conclude my presentation, you know, in my view, John Rawls gave the best definition that I've ever heard of what is a fair society because he gave it in the context of the first 1,000 days. He said one in which a new entrant would be happy to be born even though he did not know his social position ahead of time. And for this uh, to really happen, we absolutely need to understand that uh, what uh, Dr. Nader had in mind through his systems framework is a perfect fit to the social ecological model that tells us that families by themselves cannot do what it takes to prevent childhood obesity through improved feeding practices and physical activities and, and so on, unless they have a proper access to food security, health security, housing security, education, quality education for their kids and decent jobs and, and so on. And this will not happen unless we improve uh, very much uh, the, the public health uh, infrastructure of the country, the public health workforce, and we really invest in developing and implementing much more equitable and smarter social, economic, education, uh, food policies, and on and on. So I thank you very much uh, for your attention. I apologize for uh, a couple of distractions uh, because I was getting some strange messages about the sharing of my screen not working, but I hope you got to see and enjoy my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Perez Escamilla. That was really, uh, enlightening. I love uh, the focus on uh, responsive feeding and you have uh, several questions now. So um, the first question for you is a growing number of families including the children are following a vegetarian or vegan diet. Is this a concern for children and the issue of obesity? I'm not sure about the protein requirement differences among uh, children and adults. 
right. So in, in general, it is uh, possible uh, for children to consume healthy uh, vegetarian diets, uh, but one has to be extraordinarily careful with this issue during the first uh, two years of life because their nutrient requirements are extremely high per kilogram of a uh, body weight. So in general, I don't consider it to be a good idea just for parents on their own to decide they're going to, to feed a purely vegetarian diet without properly consulting with their pediatricians and ensuring if there are micronutrients that are not being met uh, through those diets that they are supplemented or given uh, or given an alternative. I know that with adults, uh, like uh, it's it's not only that it's possible. There are many cultures in the world that they are very very vegetarian and they tend to have very healthy diets where really they have really healthy uh, you know uh, plant based protein sources and. Uh, diets in India that are also extremely tasty uh, with regards to spices that they use. One concern uh, there is B12 uh, deficiency, but again, you know, uh, I would be a little bit concerned about children during the first two years of life uh, being fed a, a purely a vegan diet. So, uh, but if a family wants to do it, I, I don't think uh, it's impossible if it's done in consultation with a healthcare provider and a registered dietitian. Great, thank you. So another question is, it was mentioned that AIAN had the highest prevalence for high weight. Uh, so do you have the data from the tribes that were included in the study? So, so, so I don't, so this is national uh, data uh, from uh, the CDC, it's national uh, weak data that comes from the surveillance systems uh, that are a uh, part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and I honestly don't know if they will have enough sample size to break down by tribes, uh, but at a national level, that's a, that's a prevalence and it's, it's the highest. And, you know, it's uh, very closely followed by uh, African American kids and then uh, also Hispanic uh, Hispanic kids. So, uh, uh, so, so I I I just uh, uh, don't know if this could be disaggregated by by tribe. Yes, that's my understanding as well. So, thank you. Um, so another question is, what is the best approach to use when a child who used to eat most or every vegetable you offer now refuses most of them, even after repeatedly offering it to them? Uh, so, and then there's some other parts. So I'll ask you that once you've answered this question. So, so patience, no, is is the number one, <laughs> the number one advice. Uh, I am a. a, a a father as well and with our younger kid we went through this and it was very distressful it was very frustrating uh, both my wife and I are public health nutritionists and we're maternal child health nutritionists and we thought we knew everything about how this works and then we experienced uh, how it feels you know to have a so-called picky eater uh, I, I really think that is patience and experimenting you know with different textures uh, mixing them up with other foods that they uh, that they like. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, the environments where the foods are offered, if they are different, if they're more festive in occasions and, and things like that, uh, the, the child may feel more attracted to actually try it if the whole family is eating those foods, if they see friends eating those foods. So all those principles of uh, learning by observation, learning by uh, uh, by by association, and at the end of the day, you know, it's it's really an acquired taste when it comes to the bitter tasting vegetables that our brains are 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 really designed to reject initially because it interprets as as being poisonous or or something like that. And the the happy end of our story is our son is now thirty. 
and he eats extremely healthy and he loves all sorts of vegetables and all the stuff he didn't like. It is also true that sometimes they like it with one texture when it's mashed. And then when you move on to the next texture, they don't like it anymore. It's also true that they may go for periods of time where no, I, I just don't feel like, like having it, right? So be patient, let the child also participate and it can be replaced by another healthy, uh, healthy food. Uh, what I wouldn't do is to say if, uh, you know, if, if you eat your broccoli, then you can, you can have soda, you know, with a meal, you know, don't use the, 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 the junk food or, or sugar sweetened beverages as uh, a tool to, you know, uh, influence uh, the, wh what the child is going to eat, because that's not the way to learn to develop the self-regulation and that healthy taste preferences for the rest of their lives. Yes, I have to say, we noticed the same with our kids. Uh, it was hard to get through those early years, but now they eat everything. So it always amazes me uh, how that works. So the next part of that question are, what are your beliefs in the various phases or stages they go through as they start to assert more independence around two to three years and beyond? Yeah, so I really think that we should encourage them uh, to be independent, but being aware that they need a lot of supervision and we need to make sure that their environments are, are safe. But uh, the more we let uh, the children explore, the more uh, we let them uh, feed by themselves, uh, the more uh, we really uh, let them uh, be uh, very good at themselves knowing when they are hungry, when uh, you know they have achieved uh, satiety, the better it is going to be the self-regulation, not only of food intake but also of uh, of their of their own uh, emotions and uh, and social behavior. So what we're talking about here, responsive parenting, responsive is is very very powerful because. And people tell me, like when we work with people in early child uh, care and education, say, oh my God, this is a lot of work. I, I said, it, you know, it may be at the beginning, but at the at, at the end of the day, if this works, we're going to have less work because the kids will develop routines. They will self-regulate. They will not need, uh, you know, so much assistance and, uh, you know, so much uh, so-called infighting to uh, have them do, you know, to what what they're supposed to be doing at at different at different times so recognize uh, we need healthcare providers to be much better trained at a uh, child development uh, because that's part of the issue you know that uh, as parents we have many many questions and and especially you know each child is different it's not only with the first child and mm -hmm. if we don't have a uh, providers that really know what they're talking about when it comes to child development issues and feeding issues, then information can be, uh, you know, uh, very, very much contradictory depending on whom they see and whom they ask and misinformation starts circulating in this area very, very rapidly uh, as well. So that's a takeaway from the work that we have done that uh, the, 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 the training of, uh, you know, allied health students uh, and then in service of healthcare professionals is crucial for parents to receive sound counseling and advice. <clears throat> yeah, I think that that's an important point. I mean, in our research too, we've seen that people don't take into account child development a lot of times when they look at, at, at programs for children and adolescents, you know, that uh, they seem to think that they're the same all the way around, but what you do in one year completely changes from what you're, you're doing the next year. Or can. And, and for example, things as simple as giving anticipatory guidance in pregnancy to parents mm -hmm. to be about uh, the sleeping patterns of newborns mm -hmm. and uh, what happens uh, over time and how uh, not uh, to, to actually get so stressed that, you know, you think my child is not going to eat, it's not going to sleep uh, for, for years and I really need to give them whatever in the middle of the night so that the child stops uh, stops crying. So the, so so that sleeping, uh, crying cycles, the soothing techniques that are used end up also affecting a lot uh, 
uh, the, you know, food preferences, uh, uh, physical activity routines, and those in turn affect sleep routines. So, so that remember, keep in mind that the uh, responsive peer parenting uh, frame framework that I uh, uh, that I show because it's very scary, you know, when you have a child crying a lot and a young infant and you know just just sleeping very intermittently. But then when you learn, you know, it's, it's a normal part of the of the uh, of being a human. You know, it's, it's a normal, <laughs> healthy part of psycho uh, uh, social development of kids, and it's just going to last a few weeks. You know, if if everything works well. You know, maybe by four months, the, the baby is going to be sleeping quite well for long periods of time uh, during the night. But but that's where, you know, all these routines uh, need to be consistent in, and talking to each other with regards to uh, the self-regulation uh, that we want uh, uh, the kids to have, not only with feeding, but in, in general with, with all their, their uh, behaviors and emotions at the end of the day. Okay. So, um, how can we as practitioners differentiate between the terms responsive feeding and baby led weaning? Right. So, um, the, whoever defines for me what baby led weaning is wins, should win the Nobel Prize because depending whom you ask is the definition uh, that people have uh, in general. Uh, what uh, families, what moms have in mind is super well aligned with the responsive feeding framework and practices, you know, allowing the child to experiment, to play with the food, allowing the child uh, to uh, choose uh, what to eat uh, from a menu of choices, uh, allowing the child to feed uh, herself or himself uh, as soon as possible, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, using the feeding episode as a time, you know, for the child and the caregiver to know each other, uh, share the responsibility of the uh, of the decisions, and don't force uh, don't force the child. Uh, then, when people think about baby led winning that way, it, it is a hundred percent compatible. But on the other hand, I've also read and heard about a baby led winning approach of essentially not even offering in mash foods to babies, you know, and since the very beginning, really uh, putting in front of them is uh, large pieces of solid veggies uh, for them to chew from and, and things like that. Uh, I, I'm not in favor of that because I do think that experimenting with different textures is important for oral development, is important for a taste a development of taste preferences and so on. Uh, there are also concerns about safety issues. You know, if you're going to be doing that, you better be very, very close watching the child uh, uh, all, all the time. So there are many different definitions of, uh, of baby led winning. But at the end of the day, for example, a very key principle of responsive feeding is that, uh, you know, the, the World Health Organization recommends introducing solid foods exactly at six months. It's not about, it's, it's, it's at six months. We know that that's a public health recommendation that in reality, the babies are going to be ready at different ages. On average, yes, around six months, but some may be ready at five, some may be ready at seven. So how can caregivers tell, how can pediatricians know when a baby is ready? to be introduced to complementary foods. We need uh, to take into account the cues that the babies are given. We need to understand the motor development. Can uh, the kids sit by themselves? Can do they, they have the right uh, uh, already uh, development of uh, the swallowing uh, process? Uh, the extrusion reflex is gone. Are they expressing a lot of interest in foods? So by paying attention to uh, a group of cues, it's not that hard. And as a parent, I can tell you that to tell when when a baby is ready to be introduced to, to complementary foods. So it's really the child that is driving the decision. It's not like WHO or it's not the mother that is saying it's going to be at six months and I don't care. No one is going to tell me when it's going to be at six months. So, so that's, a, I think, a good example as to how how important it is uh, to actually the child be the one communicating the timing for different decisions 
uh, that the science tells us are healthy decisions to be made. Great. Um, another question is, would you recommend the sharing of resources you shared with early childhood educators for those of us who work in the area of nutrition education implementation in schools? Yes, and I can say I love you all guys so, so much. You you are also the best. You know, I love the WIC program and I, I love you. I love you as much, you know. I, I really think that you have an enormous role to play and this is why one of the products from the Health Eating Research Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Responsive Feeding Guidelines was designed specifically for early childcare and education centers. I also work very closely with the Ministry of Education in Mexico. So Mexico is the first country in the world that actually legislated the nurturing care framework as a basis for initial education, which is zero to three. And this is delivered uh, through three or four massive early child care and education public systems uh, that we have in the country. So we have trained thousands and thousands and thousands of, of workers, uh, professionals, paraprofessionals from early child care and education centers as to how they can implement uh, the principles of responsive feeding. Uh, uh, and also how everything links also with sleeping routines and play routines, they face very similar issues. Their first reaction was, this is great, uh, guys, but are we supposed to do this by ourselves? Uh, what about the parents? I said, well, uh, what about if people don't have money for food? Then we said, no, you're not on your own. Uh, we're doing now technical trainings, but the idea is that there will be also investment in counseling through the healthcare system from, uh, for, for the parents and that there will be a strengthening of social protection policies to really uh, bring down the problem of food insecurity uh, for families where uh, infants and young children live. So, so the, the experience in Mexico has been very nice. It has been manualized very implementation is science oriented. And, and it's really the early child care and education centers enthusiasm, the one that persuaded the, the Ministry of Education to do this, which is, which is great. Yeah, uh, some of our research has also shown that communication between the early care and education centers and in particular the teachers and the parents is very important. So applying this to it, uh, that's another way for the parents to learn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, Dr. Escamilla, it seems like these large food corporations act as a cartel with an iron hand on child foods. For the mothers who are unable to breastfeed their children on a regular basis and must resort to purchasing store-bought store breast milk, how can we remedy the breast is best concern for these uh, mothers? And it might mean store-bought formula. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, first of all, you know, my uh, position it has been and has always been and is that at the end of the day is, is a mother's choice to decide how she wants to, uh, to feed her baby. And no matter what she choices, she, she chooses, uh, she should be supported. However, I think it's very important for this to be an informed choice in a level playing field. So when we have a situation where the vast majority of women in the world are choosing to breastfeed and the great majority of them cannot breastfeed as long as they want, and we know the health uh, losses and the economic losses for the families and the employers and the countries that this represents, uh, that's where my work focuses on. What is preventing the moms who cannot meet their breastfeeding goals from doing that? And that's where we really need uh, the, the, the field nature approach. That's where we need the social ecological model approach, uh, the whole of society uh, approach. And I think that, uh, of course, if a mother chooses to formula feed, you know, she should also have access uh, to, to the formula. Uh, we should be paying a lot of attention to the pricing policies uh, because uh, infant formula is not uh, is not cheap. 
Uh, even if a mom is in the WIC program, she may not get enough uh, formula and she will still may need to, uh, to purchase uh, additional formula. And responsive feeding also applies to uh, infant formula feeding. So uh, response feeding applies and covers moms who choose uh, uh, to feed their babies with, uh, with, with infant formula uh, as well. So uh, I'm totally anti-shaming. Uh, I am totally uh, really in favor of uh, supporting the mother's choice, uh, no matter what that choice is. And either way, there's lots of responsive feeding work to do and uh, to actually have a positive influence on the self-regulation of, of the babies, their ability to, de to develop self-regulation. And I think that that's an excellent place uh, to end the presentation in the Q&A session. So uh, Dr. Perez Escamilla, we're so happy you were here today. Uh, we just have a few ending comments. Uh, first, just to remind y'all that this webinar is being archived along with the presentation slides and you'll be able to see that on our website. Um, and then uh, for those of you who have requested CHESS, MCHESS, and RD credits, they are available. If you've requested them, we'll reach out to coordinate. If you didn't request it but would like them, please follow up at dellhealthyliving at uth.tmc.edu. So thank you again to Dr. Perez Escamilla for an excellent talk. I know Dr. Nader would be very proud of this event. And thanks to our colleagues at UCSD. Um, we'd like to tell you goodbye right now and have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Dr. Perez Escamilla. Bye-bye.